Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's Be Well Lunch and Learn titled Discovering Mental Balance During Times of Change. We are so excited to have Dr. Kelly Holder here with us today. For those of you that may not know her, she is the Director for the Office for Professional Mental Health as well as an Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at the College of Medicine and Hershey Medical Center. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that these Lunch and Learns are brought to you by Penn State Health Human Resources as part of their Be Well initiative, which is an initiative to enhance employee wellness offerings across the system. We try to host these quarterly, so be on the lookout for our next one, which will be sometime in February. Once we confirm the details, we will be sending out flyers for all of you to sign up as well. Additionally, all of these Lunch and Learns are being recorded, so if you can't make the whole time today or you would like to see some of the other um, lunch and learns that we have hosted you can do so on the my solutions website um, give us a few days to edit this recording and then this one should be up there as well if you have any questions or comments for dr holder or elizabeth or any of us feel free to use the q a feature on zoom and we will get to as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation now, if you've joined us before, you'll notice that today's format is a little different. Instead of a standard presentation, we thought today's topic would best be discussed through a conversational piece. So joining Dr. Holder will be Elizabeth Hibner. She is a project manager for Penn State Pro Wellness. And since there won't be a standard presentation, we thought it would be a great to give you a heads up of some of the topics that they plan to discuss. So on the next slide here. Um, these will be the topics of discussion for today. So emotional impact of the pandemic and recent events, as well as isolation, balance, and strategies to help ourselves. Um, so at this time, I will pass it over to Elizabeth and Dr. Holder. Great. Thank you so much, Angela. And for everyone for being here today, we are really excited to have this opportunity to talk with all of you and a special shout out and welcome to our Holy Spirit folks who I know some of you have joined. So welcome. Um, we have such a great turnout. And as I said, we're very excited um, for this opportunity to talk with you. We know that 2020 has been a difficult year um, for so many of us and certainly has had an impact on us in so many ways and one of those ways mentally as well. So today's Lunch and Learn, lunch and learn as Angela talked about, is going to be really just a conversation between me and Dr. Holder. I have some questions and, and some, some things that we're going to talk about um and also encourage you to drop questions in the chat box as angela mentioned and we'll be getting to those at the end of our conversation so let's just dive right in so kelly we know that the corona coronavirus pandemic has been a challenge in so many ways epidemiologically psychologically and i've heard it described as a large-scale emotional trauma is trauma like that word just sounds very dramatic but is it correct to, to and helpful to call it that yes yes i believe yes so first i want to just say thank you for having me today and allowing me to engage in this discussion trauma i think is a good word um, we have sustained many losses and so for many of us um how traumatic this has been is going to vary across people and situations but you know people have lost a lot of things not just from the deaths of friends and family which can be significant enough um the loss of school as we know it the loss of sports the loss of time with family um loss of jobs permanently for some loss of businesses and so when you add up all of those things that people are facing, I think trauma could be a really good word to describe what we're facing. And the longer that this goes on, the more compounded our grief and losses are. Yeah, absolutely. So what are what are some of the impacts that you have seen? Um, you know, you work with folks one on one and what are some of the other impacts that you've seen emotionally um, in your work with folks? yeah so i i found that the pandemic in and of itself has exacerbated or made worse every other problem people have just already had because it has taken away some of our coping mechanisms some of the things that people do on a regular basis to stay well have been taken away like 
Um, we don't go to the gym like we used to anymore. Um, there's no commute at the end of the day to decompress for those who are working from home. Um, there is limited time with friends, um, the ability just to go and sit in a coffee shop and do some of the things that people have done to stay well have been taken away. So it's made it much more difficult to deal with the everyday problems and the other stressors that people have been facing beforehand. So I, I find this time is, is being hard because it's just made everything else just worse. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and I think so many of um, the routines that we had in place before the pandemic really served us in many ways. Like you said, like the commute things that you maybe wouldn't have even thought of were helpful for people in ways and having that transition time certainly were helpful for me and just kind of mentally getting prepared for the day, thinking about what was coming and, and starting to plan in, in, my, in my head and kind of get in the zone before I'm actually physically at work. Certainly it was helpful. And I think um, it's these things that we don't think about, like commute that have been helpful, that served us really well, that no longer, you know, some of us no longer have for those of us who are working from home. Um, and it's having to rethink some of these things. And for me, I recognize, oh, that, tra that transition time was, was really valuable for me. So how can I make a new routine that's gonna kind of serve a similar purpose and, and get me back into the group of things? But it's, it's that time, so many routines, right? It's that on top of so many other things happening. Yeah. So absolutely, I think a lot of people um, can, can connect with that, certainly. So do you, think, do you think it's helpful for our audience members to kind of think through some of these these changes or recognize these different pieces of their routine that are different? Yeah, I think it's very important. Um, if we didn't know it before, we know now how important every moment of our life is, right? And so some of the little things that we take for granted, um, I think at this point, we can't afford to take them for granted anymore. And so realizing like, how do I shift from starting to work to ending work? How do I set a boundary of when I'm working and when I'm not working? How do I set appropriate boundaries with my family if I live alone, but I need more contact or I live with a bunch of people and I need less contact, right? How do we mm -hmm. um, form those? What little routines can we add that's gonna give us more joy and help us um, have more gratitude for what we do have as we preserve our lives. I know something very simple that I've started to do and it's almost like a soundtrack to my life. I have something I listen to when I start my day. I have something that I listen to when I'm getting ready to cook. And in fact, when I play some music out of sync with those times, my kids will say to me, you're not cooking now, why are you listening to that, right? But it's such a simple thing, but for me, it triggers me into because of the music I've chosen, um, thinking about the things I'm grateful for and transitioning into a new activity and trying to be mindful and present in it because I know that little bit of taking that time for myself is a benefit. It serves me well because of the other things that have been taken away. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's like setting up those, those new routines in place to, to help serve you now that the old routines know what was going to happen because of changes and routine and just routine changes and what you're able to do and not able to do absolutely so you know we've a lot of people have you know we, we talk about the idea of like normal and people throw around the phrase like our new normal is it best to be thinking about this new normal as trying to function the way that we did pre-pandemic and trying to, you know, although we're not able to try to align it exactly like and as close as we can to how we were functioning pre-pandemic and our routines and things, um, or is there a different way that we should be thinking about norm, quote unquote normal? Yeah, so um, for me, I will just come right out and say it. I don't like the term new normal. I'm tired of hearing people say it. We haven't arrived. <laughs> we are still on a journey and we have not arrived. We haven't arrived anywhere yet, right? As time goes on and the pandemic goes on, you know, the things that serve me well in March, April, May don't serve me as well now that we are in November, right? So I have to constantly reevaluate 
what aids me in being well and how do I adapt and take care of myself? The kind of energy and fortitude I had in April and May, I don't have it anymore. It's November. I've been in my house with three kids since March, right? And so I have to constantly be aware of ways to change, to adapt to what is for myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for all of us. Um, maybe we're constantly having a new normal. Maybe the new normal today isn't the new normal from April, if you like that term. Mm -hmm. I personally don't like it. So I like to think about instead of trying to plan ahead and think too far in the future, um, trying to stay as present focused as possible and figuring out how, how do I best care for myself today? Because given all this time we've had, we if we didn't know before, we do know that so much is outside of our control. There's so much uncertainty that um, we have to really just focus on what is in front of us and what we can do. And to your other point, can we just adapt our life prior to COVID to now? Well, there's some things that are necessary. So we're gonna have to do adaptations for what the necessary. Um, but maybe we need to start thinking about some of the things that aren't necessary and coming up with new ways to live our lives and new ways to appreciate things. I know a major challenge coming up will be the holidays. We're currently in a major challenge as the election isn't over yet and some people are dealing with that uncertainty. So there's always something to tackle, some new uncertain thing that we haven't done before and be being willing to think outside of the box to find solutions for our own problems as individuals. Mm -hmm. it really sounds like kind of um, constantly reevaluating and seeing what's what's working and what's not working, rather than putting this pressure on ourselves to function the way that we used to or that we did in March, um, because that that in and of itself is additional stress and and things that, that don't serve us, that we don't need, um, if, we're, if we're trying to just maintain um, the way that we were before the pandemic, really. Yeah. yeah. So um, why, could you, why, could you talk a little bit about why you think people are experiencing more mental health concerns or where their mental health concerns are a little bit more exacerbated than they were before um, the pandemic and everything else that has been happening lately? Yeah, I, I honestly think it's it's like we're we're universally in this pressure cooker together, right? And so we take away all of our extras, all of the ways in which we could ignore, right? So no longer can we look away from our problems. We have to look at them because there's so many, our lives are limited in some way. And then um, because we can't look away and because things have gotten worse for each of us individually because of just all the new challenges. Um, I, I also think that, and, and this is my hope, I'm an optimist. I also think that part of it is more openness to talk about mental health. I mean, we were already on that trajectory, but I think this pandemic has made it even easier for people to talk about it because it's not isolated anymore. It's not just, you know, the people who, are struggling with mental health and the people who aren't, it's like all of us are struggling with mental health issues and how are we getting through whatever, wherever we fall along that spectrum because life is so challenging. And so I think there may be a bit of it that people are more willing to talk about it because so many, so many more of us are facing these challenges now, not just with the pandemic, but with the election, with the, um, what we'll call a racial pandemic and the social unrest and just all the things that have come and have complicated our lives since March. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to identify that, that that's the case, right? That we are, like so many people are struggling with these mental health concerns, whether they're um, really impeding in your everyday life or if they're more minimal um, than some other folks, it's still a uh, mental health um, concern that, that can be addressed and, and, and worked, worked on. Um, and I, I will say, I will kind of put in here for the folks that are, that are listening right now, we will, we'll be talking up in the, at the end of this, we'll be, Kelly, we'll be talking a little bit more about resources and, and things, and strategies that um, can help and resources that Penn State Health has to offer um, employees in this space. So stay tuned for that. We, you know, I think, like I said, it's important to identify these things, but also help. There is help out there that's available as well. 
Yeah, so let's talk about this idea of isolation. This is something that you brought up to me that you've seen as a theme and, and something that um, once we once we talked about it, you know, before this um, before this meeting in preparation for this meeting, meeting um, it wasn't something that first came to my mind that isolation would necessarily be a, a major um, a major theme coming out of this, but it really is, and it's it's something a little it's it's more than just physically being alone, right? Like it's it's more of a of a of a phenomenon that's happening. Um, based on the pandemic and the racial injustices and the election and kind of more of a state of being and a little bit more complex. So could you talk about that and first kind of share how you would define isolation and an example of maybe what that looks like? Um, and because it's really not this just a physical state of being, right? Yeah. So if I were to define isolation, um, it, I would say that it is this idea of um, feeling as though that you have not truly connected with anyone um, in your world. Um, I like the words, you know, people say, I see you. Like, I love, I like mm -hmm. that phrase so much. I see you, you know, when someone says that to you, you're, you get this idea that they get you. Like, they know what's mm -hmm. going on. It's not just surface, they get you, right? And so, you know, how many of us are really being seen by others? And um, that has, it's always been a problem, but with the pandemic, it's much more challenging because many of us can't even physically be present with the people that we love anymore. So we have to make all these extra efforts to be connected with them. And sometimes given our work or our life situation, we might not feel the motivation to reach out and make sure that we connect or see someone else, right? or to have an opportunity for someone to see us in the sense that we're being vulnerable enough so someone can see what's going on with us. And so that kind of isolation, um, it definitely works up against our own mental health because as human beings, we're made for meaning making and we're, we are made for having connections and being seen, right, by other people. Mm -hmm. And so this pandemic has made it much more challenging and for those of us who are more um, react to things in a more passive way, it could be much harder because we're not used to being activated to say, this is a need of mine. I have to actively speak it out and make sure I am in real community with people, with people who get me and see what's going on with me. It can be much more of a challenge if you're not in the habit of figuring out how you can really um, connect with other people. But it's so necessary and the efforts are well worth it. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge also is because just because we seek it out doesn't mean we'll get what we, we need. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we have to be relentless and continue to pursue or make sure we find a community where we fit, we find a person who can really see us and have those conversations with us um, because it's good for our mental health. It helps our resiliency and it kind of bleeds into every other area of our life. So the isolation, can become a serious problem if we don't face it and, and tackle it head on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. It makes so much sense when you talk about it in, that, in this context of um, finding meaningful relationships that you can connect with and can, can serve you and is add, some, add, something that's adding to your life. Um, makes makes so much sense. And, and I think, um, you know, finding those people that we can connect with in, in this pandemic state is, is just so important. Um, and something certainly that's been very helpful for me and, and my family and, and friends and things. And um, I think myself and probably a lot of people who do have um, connections with people, they, they maybe have become closer um, because of the just the struggles in general that have been happening right now. I think even my colleagues, um, my team has worked, com is, has transitioned to be working completely remotely right now. And I think, um, or, you know, since March. Um, but still doing that. And I think because of that and going through that together has brought our team closer as well. And, and our relationships are stronger because we're, you know, at the beginning, we were, all right, how are you doing? How, how are things going? How are things at home? Um, and really just provide a great opportunity for connection in our team. Um, so, so absolutely. So um, could you speak a little bit about um, those empo employees who are caring directly for COVID patients? or clinical folks who have been affected um, by these changes. So obviously there's a good good portion of our workforce that's working from home like you and I, but then certainly our clinical folks that their their work environment is looking very different. Um, and 
isolation is looking very different to them than it would to, um, may look different to them than it would to, to us. Um, so could you talk about how isolation might be apparent to them in their situation and kind of just what are some of the strategies for connection with, um, for them in, in their state? Yeah, um, so I, I like how you phrase it, that their isolation may be very different. Um, depending on their workload and what they're doing, the stress that they're feeling in their environment, and also the the climate of the world, because you know, you if you're spending your time working with COVID patients and then you come out of clinic and on the news and in your world you hear that COVID's not a thing and people aren't wearing masks, that kind of thing, that can make you feel isolated in the sense of you're doing this hard work to keep people alive, mm -hmm. and there's this other portion of the world who is is denying what's what's happening and that kind of isolation um can be just as draining as the isolation we talked about before because mm -hmm. it it um drains away at the meaning and the value that you're offering to the world so it's going to be really important that you connect with other people who are having similar experiences and you have safe spaces to talk about what's happening um, making sure that you're enriching your world in that way. I know they just started the We Care program, and that's a really great place for people to get that kind of connection um, within the clinic settings. Um, so the isolation may be different in the sense that you're around people all the time, but again, who sees you? Who really gets what you're mm -hmm. going through during the day and then sees how the things you hear in the news or the people you just see in your regular world when you come out of the hospital are interacting with you or even just responding to this virus in, in general, that's going to have an impact mm -hmm. on you. And you need to make sure you have people who see you who can generate mm -hmm. positive meaning for you so it doesn't take away mm -hmm. from your own mental health. That's great. Really, it's isolation is um, more about meaningful connection than relationship rather than your physical interactions with human beings, right, to sum it up. So let's segue, we can segue and talk about this idea of balance. So um, it's a phrase that's thrown around here and there and something that you shared with me is, is maybe not the best word to be using because it's not quite achievable. And I think that when I heard that from you, I'm like, oh, that actually, that, that makes me breathe a little bit more because this idea of balance maybe of, you know, we're arriving to this point where finally we have a work-life balance is just not, not something that's achievable or realistic. Um, could you talk about that a little bit more and, and kind of go into more detail about that? Yeah, um, so for those of you listening, I, I don't know how you'll feel about this, but I do not like the word balance. I don't like it at all. And it's more because most of us don't use that word, how it's defined in the dictionary or anything like that. When people talk about balance, they're often talking about just holding all these things and just, doing them all great, how can I hold all these things? And I think when people say balance, we really mean that how can we negotiate our lives in a meaningful way so that the things that are most important stay important. And when things become less important, we start to drop those things off a little bit. And so, um, so, so that when I talk to people and mm -hmm. I'm clear about what I'm saying, I usually shy away from the word balance we talk a lot about negotiation. How are you going to negotiate all the areas of your life in a way that makes sense for you? Because we know that life is not static. It's dynamic. Things change. You don't always have the same capabilities every day. And so trying to figure out what is necessary in this day and what can I drop or, or move or do less of. And then other times I do more of it and focus on that because of the season of my life, because of the conditions of what's going around me. And um, it's really, that negotiation is highly personal. And so we all have to really take the time to be very self-reflective and figure out what makes most sense in my world right now and how do I fit in the priorities and, and as far as possible, um, spend less time with the things that are taking away from my mental health and well-being. Um, and it's not to say that it's easy to do, but I think, if we think about it that way, it takes away the pressure that everything has to be right all of the time. And I, I, don't think, I don't think we can live well that way when in our minds we think, I have to do this part of my life perfectly and that part and that part and that part and that part. You know, it just starts to add up and feel like too much. 
Mm-hmm. That's certainly a relief to me. I hearing hearing you talk about it in that way, it's seeing life a little bit more fluid than than you know, like you said, having each part of your life perfectly together. Which just I think if there's any time to tell all of us that that is not really achievable, it certainly was. 2020, right, um, kind of poked a hole in, in that and um, is a relief to know that that maybe not be, may not be the best way to think about um, all of the pieces of our lives. And um, so that's great. So could you talk um, a little bit about some of in the last couple minutes here, and then we'll jump into questions. Um, could you share some of your routines for mental wellness along with help, helpful practices and resources that are available for staff members? Yeah, so um, I'll just start by saying if you haven't been to the, is it the Be Well website? Um, yes, the Pro Well, so it's the Pro Wellness website, um, and we can send it in the follow up email for folks. Yes, if you haven't been there, you're missing out because there's so many links and toolkits and different information that can inspire you to put together whatever wellness routine works for you. For me, I have, I think it's six things that I like to do that promote my own wellness. And so I don't do all the things every day, but every day I try to do at least three of them. And so for me, it includes exercise, um, meditation of some kind, prayer of some kind, or you can put those together if you wanted. Um, I also spend a lot of time in my faith and spiritual life, so Bible reading, journaling um, is really important to me as well. Um, and then I have like my drinking water, because I can show you my water, drinking water because it's good for me and it's probably an aspirational goal as every day I try to get to the level that I need to. Um, but the days that I do more things, um, I feel a lot better. And so it aids me in wanting to do more things the next day. So each day I just put those things down. And if I can get through half of them, um, I know that I have at least put some time and some effort into my own wellness and well-being. And so kind of like I was talking before, it's like some days, there's more space and more capacity than others, depending on the other things that fall on my list. The other thing that I do to promote my own wellness is that when I do my to-do list every day, I put one spot for joy. And I try to do at least one thing a day that brings me joy that's outside of my wellness activities. And so for me, that leaves me with this freedom to mm-hmm. play a game with my kids or spend an extra time outside or call a friend, like whatever I want it to be, watch a TV show that I've been looking forward to, whatever it is. But by having something that brings me joy embedded into my task list, it just reminds me of um, that I am also a priority, right? That, you know, I, I don't have to be the last person on the list. And as I inspire joy in my own life, it aids me in wanting to do all the other things on my list. So those are some of the things that I do for myself. Yeah, that's great. And a lot of that um, makes me think of the eight dimensions of wellness, which, you know, talk about uh, they just address physical and spiritual and, and emotional. And there's, there's many others, intellectual, um, that if folks are thinking about how can I how can I make this work for myself, that might be a good place to start to just kind of think about these different areas that you could um, do an activity in that would that would help you. Um, help you throughout the day. Um, and, and you've talked, Kelly, about this idea of pouring into yourself so that you can serve and pour into others. And, you know, there's a reason on airplanes when they tell you um, if, if you need to use oxygen masks, you put it on yourself first and then you put it on your kids. And I think that that is just such a great example and, and something that's um, so relevant to our workforce. And, and those of us, all of us who are serving others, whether it be in the clinical setting and you're working with patients or someone or our researchers, who are um, working with their research participants, working with funders, really the same idea can apply in so many areas. And um, just, I think, you know, being able to have those routines and activities that can pour into, your, pour into yourself so that you can, can best serve others well is just so important and, and so valuable. So thank you so much. Um, do you have any other um, resource, resources or things that you would like to talk about that uh, for our employees? And then we can jump into questions. So. As we're wrapping up here, if folks want to throw their questions into the chat box, 
We may go over a little bit, um, but we want to be able to address your questions um, and any thoughts that you may, may have. But Kelly, any other kind of final thoughts about yeah. or, or um, ideas for resources for our, um, for our employees? Yes, I think um, another great resource is our um, Comp Psych uh, EAP program, or I think it's Health Associates if you're on the College of Medicine <laughs> side. I've checked out yeah. both of these EAP programs during the pandemic. I knew about them before, but I hadn't investigated, investigated, and um, our HR staff has done an excellent job of putting together, there's tons of resources, so not just counseling, um, but some other legal, all sorts of things. So if you're not familiar with your EAP program, become familiar with it because there's tons of things available to you. And this is a mm -hmm. great resource, great resource for everyone. So I wanna just- mm -hmm, it'll connect. That. Yeah, absolutely. And they'll connect you with a professional um, who, who you can have conversations with. And um, so it's really high quality um, assistance and, um, I think certainly something that we all can take advantage of, really. Yes, definitely. Oh. Definitely. Great. All right. So um, in the last couple minutes, we're going to dive into any questions that were in the chat box. So feel free to throw your questions in there. And I'm going to pass it over to Angela to, to share with us the questions that um, folks have posted. Sure. Um, we don't have any right now, so um, I'll just give a few minutes for people to do the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, we also, if I can put it up here, um, we have a, a evaluation of today's Lunch and Learn. So if you just want to um, put um, this Bitly link into your URL and do the um, this evaluation, we will greatly appreciate it. So I'm trying to make this bigger for you. All right. All right, so let's see if we have any questions. Um, so someone asked, could you list um, Kelly's personal wellness items again? Oh, so the things that I do for myself? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Exercise, meditation and or prayer, um, journaling. Um, I spend some time doing some spiritual reading for me that's um, reading my Bible, um, water, and I know I had a sixth one. I think I break up the prayer and meditation. Your one. joy? The, oh, and the then joy my joy. activity? I do a separate yeah. list for joy. And it could be whatever. Anything that brings me joy, I try to get one, at least one joy activity in a day, if not more, <laughs> but at least one. Great. I love that. That's great. Any ideas for the best way to help our teams during this time? I, you know, it's challenging. I think you know, because personalities are different, but letting your teams know that you care as a leader and figuring out ways to connect people as much as possible. And then trying to vary it up, that it's not always just a Zoom meeting, maybe it's some challenge, or maybe it's, um, I know early in the pandemic, I was handwriting cards and mailing them out, right? Um, maybe I'll go back to that again. But, you know, just try to vary it up so that you reach all the different kinds of people within your team. And I think they'll get the message that you care and that you want them to be connected and not alone. I think that's probably the most important thing right now. Great. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can jump in there real quick. Our team, um, one thing that we do is birthdays are important on our team. So we actually will do um, Zoom virtual little birthday parties and use that as a time to, to, con to connect with the team and have just a great time to, to talk with one another about non-work things. Um, and really just serves as a, a good way to recognize individuals and also um, have a team building opportunity as well. That's Great. nice. I like that. <laughs> um, Kelly, are there any books that you would recommend to find balance? Books. Oh, man. So I, I am, I've read so many books. Okay, my, one of my most favorite books that I read is called Essentialism. It's by Greg McCohen. I um, changed my life after I read that book. Um, and so it's essentialism. It's, it, it's a good book because it helps identify what are your priorities. And then it aids with kind of generating how you create the world that you need it to be. Um, it's a good one. I'm trying to think of another one. Um, oh man, that's the one that comes to my mind right off the, oh, someone has Self Matters by Dr. Phil. Haven't read it, but I saw it jump jump up in um, in the chat box. 
somebody likes and we it. can we can um put the um essentialism we can send that info in the follow-up email and kelly if you think of any um between now and then or you think of any right after that we can always throw them in there for folks okay someone yeah. also said becoming as well it's a good book i love that book <laughs> i enjoyed it very much great i also read that book and i i also can can say that it was wonderful <laughs> great recommendation all right i think we have one last question and someone says i constantly talk myself down with change like i'm not doing things good enough how do i quit this self-sabotage talk yeah the way we think and the way we talk to ourselves really really matters um and so I'll give a reference and then I'll give an example of something you can do. So one of my favorite books about changing how we think, it's called Mind Over Mood. Um, it's a really great book if, if you wanna work more on that in particular. But I think sometimes it's, it's good to take a moment to say, wait a minute, is how I'm thinking actually helping me get to the task or is it taking away from me doing the task? And if it does not help towards the goal of the task, then on that, on its merits, those merits alone, whether it's true or not, it's not a good place to spend your mental energy. And then start thinking, is there something better that I could believe about what's going on for me, right? Is there something better I could think about? Because the truth is, is the way we think about things will enable us to actually have movement and momentum in our lives. And so just because something is true doesn't mean that we need to spend our time thinking about it. It just means, all right, maybe I need to switch how I'm thinking in a way that will motivate me to make some of the necessary changes I wanna make. The other thing I do, I must say before, because that's my answer pre-COVID answer, right? My COVID answer is, is that we also have to accept that we've been in eight months of a pandemic and we may need to slow down and we have to allow that to be okay that we are not going to function at the same levels we were functioning in, in february and january of this year um, and so some acceptance of what's really happening to us and what's really going on our, going on in our world is really important right now it's really 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 important so i throw that out there too. great and i lied one more came in so this will be the last question because we don't want to take up too much of your time but any tips for those who are recharged by being around people but cannot due to the pandemic oh man <laughs> this one's rough because <laughs> i i am an extrovert like extroverted of extroverts right and i haven't seen a lot of i mean i rarely see people so it's this is a question i have been grappling with and I have found, I'm just gonna share what's been working for me, is that um, for me to get that recharge, I actually have to put effort into calling and spending time with people I know recharge. Like not just the general, you know, like how you could go into a room and just get recharged off of people, you know, prior to COVID. It can't be willy nilly anymore. It's like, all right, I have this friend, this friend, this friend. If I call and talk to them, I know I'm gonna be revived because we are gonna laugh and this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen. And taking the time to reach out to them, set up Zoom meetings with them, get a text link and just start a text stream with them where you can throw in jokes or talk with each other or laugh about things. Because again, it's gonna take extra effort because you just can't come into a room of people like you did pre-COVID. So. Those are the things that are working for me in trying to get that charge off of seeing and being with other people, you know, in a way, since I can't see it and be with other people. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much. This has been so fun and so educational for all of us. So we really appreciate your time, Dr. Holder. Yeah. Um, just <laughs> once again, if you would be willing to fill out an evaluation, the bit.ly link is there. I also put it into the chat box. You can just click that link and it should pop right up. Um, again, be on the lookout for our February Lunch and Learn. Again, we're still trying to figure out some details there, but we'll have a flyer out as soon as possible. Um, and with that, we just thank you all for your time. We will follow up with an email. So if you signed up for this, you will be getting um, the email with all the follow-ups in it as well. You know, we had a question about that. But um, thank you all, be well, and enjoy the rest of your week.